Fred Gray. Yes, sir. Happy to see you. It's good to see you. Well, actually, I should be thanking your wife, right? Yes. Uh, because when we made the call, uh, she said, you're going to do this. Yeah, <laughs> I, I usually, uh, from now, I get a lot of calls, and uh, sometimes three or four a day, and I can't handle them all, so I have a few people that I, I send them to as soon as they come in. And, of course, when I sent that one. Carol said, you got to go and listen to that one. <laughs> I'm here. Well, see, that's why, uh, I, look, I, uh, mama, daddy and mama said, look, you take care of the wife, you take care of uh, the secretary, you take care of the mama, you're going to always be good. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> and my 66 years of law practice and dealing with persons in the, each of those categories is the same. And it's like one of the old prophets of old said in the Bible, he who findeth a wife findeth a good thing. And I've had two good ones. <laughs> All right. And then. still have one. All right then. All right then. Um, how, how, how do you respond? Or how, does it, how do you feel when folks go, the legendary Fred Gray, the, the civil rights stalwart, the, uh, the, the beacon of light, when they, all these descriptions, folks, uh, have of you? Well, uh, you, I would like to hear all of them, but you probably <laughs> hear more of them than I do. <laughs> but uh, when I started to practice in the law, I never thought about any legends, never thought about anything other than trying to destroy everything segregated I could find. And that's what I have tried to do for the last 66 years of my 90 years of life. I talked to Ambassador Andrew Young, and he said, uh, Dr. King did not make a move without checking with you first. Well, that is true for the first 382 years when from the time he was introduced and I was one of the two persons who were involved in, in that process. You mean the uh, bus boycott? Huh? The bus boycott? But uh, he, I think your question was whether or not that he always checked with me before he moved. And the answer to that is yes. And I always tried to be sure that the answer I gave Dr. King and all of my other clients was correct before I gave it to him. That, in the moment, no one 
knows how history is going to uh, record those events. Um, for you in the moment, was it just simply another day, work, um, not thinking about how we would be thinking about the Montgomery bus boycott, thinking about Albany, thinking about Birmingham and Selma, thinking about all of these changes some 50 plus years later. For you, in that moment, um, what's going through your mind? What comes to my mind is that all of those instances that you mentioned, except for Birmingham, because I didn't do anything in Birmingham because you had black lawyers up there. Arthur Shores was my mentor. You had Peter Hall. You had Ozell Billingsley. Those three lawyers were the lawyers who were working with civil rights cases when I was admitted to the bar. So uh, when I think of those cases, and even go back to Selma, because Selma didn't start with the Selma to Montgomery March in 65. Mm. I saw something that was going to happen in Selma in December of 1955. Really? Yes. What was that? Well, shortly after the bus boycott started, I got a call uh, from the uh, president of the NAACP chapter in Selma. And he, I think it was Reverend Hunter, he told me that there was a man over there named Jones, Wesley Jones, a sergeant in the Air Force who was stationed at Craig's Air Force Base. And he had gotten arrested. And so they called me to come and defend him. I went over the cell and I found, when I talked to Sergeant uh, Wesley, he said he was coming from work and he was a, a sergeant at Craig Air Force Base mm -hmm. and lived in the city. And he uh, stopped at a stop sign and there was another car in front of him that was stopped also while the light was red. When the light began to into green, the car ahead of him didn't move. So he just tooted his horn, thinking if he just tooted his horn that the man would, person would go ahead. Instead, the man, instead of moving, he got out of his car. He was a white man. And there was a, dis a little discussion between the two of them. Then finally, both of them got back in their cars and Wesley Jones went on about his business. A little later that evening, the police came to him with a warrant for his arrest where the white man had accused him of disorderly conduct or something. And so uh, Reverend Hunter and the NAACP thought that if the police would issue a warrant in a situation like that, this man needed to have def uh, defense. So I went over there, took a couple of persons with me, including my brother-in-law, Hilbert Hill, and another fellow named Frank Massey. And we went and had this trial. And of course, it was a segregated trial in the city court of the city of Selma. And uh, the two persons who were with me had sat on the segregated side. And I went on up, got through trying my case. And of course, unfortunately, he was found guilty. But something else happened in the course of that trial. I was referring to my client as Mr. Jones. And guess what the judge did? What? The judge stopped me from calling him Mr. Jones. And at first I didn't realize what he was talking about. Then it dawned on me that the judge didn't want me to call my client Mr. in his coat. Wow. So I said, oh, your honor, He's a sergeant in the United States Army. May I call him Sergeant Jones? Oh, so that's fine. That's the mentality of white people, a white judge in Selma in 1955. And I knew then that there were some problems. But that wasn't the end. 
uh, when the man found him guilty, I was going to appeal. There was only one black man over there that they would let sign bonds, and I was sending somebody out to get him. In the meantime, I looked, and Frank Massey, one of the persons who had come over with me, I didn't see him. And then a police officer, and in those days all of them were white, he was a big, tall, burly fellow. Almost to me, he looked like he was about 10 feet, but I know he wasn't that tall. And uh, he said, if you're looking for that inn that drove you over here, he's in jail. I said, in jail? Well, the jail was right down the hall. He said, yes. I said, what he was in jail for? drinking liquor in the courtroom. Well, I knew that wasn't true. I said, well, may I go back and see him? He let me went back. I talked to Frank. And Frank said, well, what happened, Fred, is that I was sitting there in the courtroom, and a black guy came in with a white uniform on and sat by me, stayed a few minutes, and got up and left. And a few minutes later, a police officer came, touched me on the shoulder, and said, come and go with me and bring that bottle under your seat with you. And true enough, there was a liquor bottle under his seat. And of course, Frank said, well, apparently it happened. He didn't pay any attention to it. But we found out later that that was an inmate in jail. Wow. Uh, and he had brought the liquor and laid it there, and then they took Frank over and lectured to him. And this is what Frank told me, he said, he says, that the police told me, said that Ian up there, that Ian lawyer, and those Ian's over in Tuskegee has a mess going on in Montgomery, and we're not going to have any mess in Selma. You tell him that when he crossed that bridge, don't ever come back to Selma. That was my introduction to Selma. Of course, I had known Mrs. Borrington over there and it had some little real estate matters that had taken place. But I knew then that it's just gonna be a time before something happened. And of course, Bloody Sunday happened. It was some almost 10 years later. Why the law? Yes, sir. Why the law? Why did, you, why did you decide to go into the legal profession? Was it something specific, what you always wanted to do? What was it? Uh, talking about how I got involved in the legal... Oh, why did you want to be a lawyer? What, what led you to want to be, become a lawyer? Oh, okay. Well, uh, that's a long story, because I was born in 1930. That was about the beginning of the part of the Depression. I was the youngest of five children. My father died when I was two. My mother had very little uh, education, formal education. But she told the five of us we could be anything we wanted to be if we did three things. One, keep Christ first in your life. Two, stay in school and get a good education. And three, stay out of trouble. I tried to do that and tried to instill that into my children and grandchildren. So, but as I grew up, everything was completely segregated, and you had a white world and a black world, and blacks basically worked for whites and did what they wanted done. And I determined that there were two nice professions that black boys could consider, and they were being a teacher a preacher. And if you did either one, you had to do it on a non-segregated basis. So I decided I was going to do both. <laughs> I grew up at the Holt Street Church of Christ in Montgomery, and we had a preacher from Tennessee who knew that there was a, a boarding school up in Nashville of the Church of Christ where they take these boys and teach them how to be preachers. And he told my mother, even though she didn't have any money, she says he uh, Fred need to go up to that school. And he took us up there when I was eight years old to the National Christian Institute. 
to learn how to become a preacher. And apparently I was doing pretty good. At because, the age of eight? Huh? At eight? At, well, I, no, I was 12 then. Got it, okay. No, I was baptized when I was eight. Got it. But I went to Nashville when I was 12. Uh, and that was after I, I was in the eighth grade at the time. Got it. So uh, the president of the school, whose name was Marshall Keeble, he was one of our old pioneer preachers, and he knew both white and black people who were in the church. And he decided that uh, while he was not an educated man, he knew people, and his responsibility as president was to uh, go and raise money and recruit students. And he said, he decided one way he was going to do that is take these little boys who was learning something about preaching. And when he go and travel in the southeast to these black churches of Christ, he would let these boys get up and preach first. They raise a collection for them. And uh, they come out back to the school. And he tell them, said, now you send your boys to us, even though they're bad boys, we can make them like these boys. <laughs> so I must have been pretty good because I traveled with them throughout Tennessee and Georgia and Florida and Alabama and Louisiana and a part of eastern Texas. And I finished there in 1948. I now know a little something about preaching. Came back to Montgomery to attend Alabama State College for Negroes, now Alabama State University, to learn how to do, be a teacher. I lived on the west side of town, which was the ghetto area where nobody, nothing good supposed to come from in Washington Park and Jeff Davis and Day Street. Uh, so I had to use the public transportation system. And I saw that our folks were being mistreated on the buses, and one man had been killed as a result of an altercation on the buses. So I made a commitment, and I saw that everything else was completely segregated based on race. I didn't know anything about lawyers, but they told me that lawyers uh, helped people who had problems. And I thought black people in Montgomery at that time had problems. And that was between 1948 and 1951. So I made the commitment then that I was going to finish Alabama State, try to finish with honors so that I could get accepted in law school, go to somebody's law school. Well, I'm going to apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me and I didn't want to raise any sand with anybody on anything. But uh, at that time, all of the southern states, including Alabama, under the case decided in 1939, Gaines versus U.S., decided uh, that to keep blacks from going to the white universities where they wanted to go to graduate or professional schools and they didn't have them at Alabama State, Alabama A&M, not Tuskegee, mm -hmm. the state would pay a portion of their tuition roaming the board and their transportation costs. So I said, well, I'll take advantage of that. <laughs> the bad part about it, it was on a reimbursement basis. So I had to pay all these expenses wow. before I could get them back. But I made the decision then that I was going to finish state, go to somebody's law school, finish the law school, take the bar exam, even though then if you finished the university uh, law school at the University of Alabama, uh, you didn't have to take the bar exam. You were admitted on, on motion, but I was going to take it, pass it, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. That was the motivating fact behind it. I finished Alabama State in May of 50, uh, 51. I finished law school. I went to Case Western Reserve, now Case Western Reserve. It was Western Reserve University then uh, in 1951 in September. Finished in June of 51, 54. Stopped by Columbus and took the Ohio bar exam just in case, <laughs> and a month later took the Alabama bar exam 
And in August of 54, I was told I passed both. And on the 7th of September, 1954, I was licensed to practice law. Now I'm ready to begin to destroy everything segregated I could find. <laughs> Those are the motivating facts about me going to law school. There's a display right here. Uh, says Dixie Justice. Dixie what? Dixie Justice, yeah. right here. Yes. It says Reconstructing Alabama Law. And when you think about freedom fighters, um, there are people who protest, there are people who march, there are those folks like me who are journalists, but the reality is if you don't have the lawyers, you can't dismantle systems. The lawyers also needed the street activists. The street activists needed the journalists. The journalists needed the preachers. The reality is to bring down Jim Crow, it took a collective effort of black folks to make it happen. That is exactly what I have been telling people all the time, is that what developed into the civil rights movement of the late 50s and 60s and forward. It was a combination of people doing different things and all of them were very important and you've, you've outlined them. But the lawyer's role, and I used to have people who would tell me, they, say that they, they, they tell me you said you did something in the civil rights movement but I never did see you in the marches. I said, that's right, you didn't. <laughs> the only time I marched was a ceremonial march. <laughs> I marched from my office in downtown Montgomery up to the courthouse after they finished the Selma to Montgomery march. So it took all of those people that you talked about working together with proper legal advice in order to do it. The lawyers didn't, I mean, as a lawyer, I didn't try to do all of it. It was enough for me and I had to get help enough just to handle the legal matters and let them know that what you're about to do is illegal under, under the law. Now you need to know that. Now if you violate it, you're going to have to be prepared to take whatever the consequences are. So then, if you want to do it, fine. If you want to go to jail, be prepared to do it. If you want me to get you out while you're there, fine. If you want to stay in there a while and then get me, just let me know. <laughs> so it takes all of these efforts cooperatively. And no one could have done it by themselves. And no one tried to do all of it. Well, that's why uh, Ambassador Young always says, Dr. King would make it clear. He said, look, everybody can't march. He said, because somebody got to bail us out when right. we hit in the trouble. You got that? Your lawyer can't be sitting next to you in the jail. <laughs> you need your lawyer outside. <laughs> that's right. That is exactly right. And that's why, uh, as I see individual, and we did that during the Montgomery boycott. And we probably did it because things were so bad and we had been treated so unjustly that anybody who would come together and try to help us do something, let's all work together to get it done. And that's why the African Americans were able to stay off of the buses for 382 days uh, doing the bus boycott. When, when you think back to all of those moments, I've often said, that one of the greatest mistakes that we make today is that we focus on the march, the speech, the event, but not the strategizing, the, the, the planning, the discussion. Uh, talk about that, what that was like to be in those conversations in the back and forth, whether it was King or Lowry or Marshall or all different players, Wilkins and Whitney Young, everyone, as they strategize and walk through and visualize and 
bounce things off and you're the, you're there as the lawyer uh, navigating that as well. How vital the strategizing was in the movement. It was very, very important. And let me tell you about the Montgomery bus boycott because I'm almost the only person who was in the inner circle of the planning of the Montgomery bus boycott, I think there's probably only one now that's left other than me. And that one was one that ended up uh, uh, getting out of the movement before it was over and going on something else. So of those who stuck with it, I'm just about the only one who's there. Let me tell you how the plans were made. And most people didn't know about it even then, and they were part of it <laughs> in connection with keeping people off of the buses. Well, we all realized that at some point, we're going to have to file a lawsuit to declare the uh, city ordinances and state statutes unconstitutional. However, it takes a long time to do a lawsuit. You can do it, you try, you got two or three appeals, take two or three years. And if you're gonna tell people immediately that you got to stay off of the buses until a lawsuit is resolved, they say you whistling Dixit. However, if you tell them, let's stay off for a day as a protest for something, that's different. Well, Joanne Robinson, who was a professor at Alabama State in English, had had a bad experience on the buses as far back as 1948. And that bus wasn't even completely full, but she sat about mill ways and she had a bus driver who wanted her to sit further in the back and mm. she just got off the bus. But she became, uh, the chairman of the Women's Political Council, which was a group of black women in Montgomery who was trying to produce or increase the living conditions for all African Americans. She started documenting every incident that she could find. So, and she said, what we need to do is stay off of these buses. So you had people who got arrested one or two times we knew about Claudette Carvin, the 15-year-old girl who did what Mrs. Parks did, but did it uh, nine months before without any instructions and any prodding or any encouragement. She just thought it was wrong after she had been studying black history, incidentally, the week before. But we, I represented her, and she was my first civil rights case. And when I lost her case before Judge Hill in the juvenile court where they found her to be a delinquent and then placed her on unsupervised probation, which was saying nothing. <laughs> I tried to get the judge and tried to tell him that what they were trying to do was to enforce the segregation laws, but he wouldn't listen to me. He still found her guilty. So what we did, so they, Joanne had that, and she had gotten the leaders in Montgomery and E.D. Nixon was the Mr. Civil Rights involved. And after that, uh, the, she was convicted, uh, had a meeting with the city officials about it. They said, well, we're sorry what happened to that girl, but it won't happen again. We later, uh, later then Rosa Parks case came up on December 1st. Well, I knew her from my earlier days. And on the day of her arrest, we had had one of our conferences that we had had for about a year since I started practicing. And we had been talking about how, what you should do if you are arrested on the buses. I was going out of town that afternoon and we had ended our little conference. So when I got back, I had phone calls from Mrs. Parks and a lot of other folks telling me that Ms. Parks had been arrested and she wanted to see me. I called her and she told me to come over to her house. This was in the afternoon of December 5th. I went by and talked to Ms. Parks. She told me what happened 
And she said, my case is set for trial for 8.30 Monday morning, December 5th. That's just three days away. This is Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. She retained me to represent her. I said, fine, Ms. Parks, don't worry about your case. But let me tell you this. She said, you know, Joanne Robinson has been talking about for some time, and particularly since uh, Claudia Carvin's case, uh, that people ought to stay off of the bus as a unified effort to let them know we mean business. And I said, I'm going to talk to her and see, I think if we're going to ever do that, you're doing what you have done is enough. So you don't need to get involved in any of the rest of this. You just go on, take, take it easy, and I'm going to talk with you again between now and Monday. I said, but I'm going to go and talk to Mr. Nixon, who has a majority of the black people following him, and he had signed her bond to get her out. I went a few blocks to Mr. Nixon's house, talked to him. He was a Pullman carpoter. Mr. Nixon was not an educated man, but he was a well-elevated man. <laughs> and he was a man who, who didn't believe in a whole lot of planning, but he, he did action. He said, and I told him, I said, well, you know, Joanne has been talking about getting these people to stay off the buses. He said, well, you all go ahead, talk about it. Let me know what you want me to do, and I'll support it. I go to Joanne Robinson's house. She lives on the other side of town, not far from Alabama State. We sat down in Joanne's living room, the two of us, and made the plans for the Montgomery bus boycott. It couldn't come out that either one of us were doing it because she was employed by the state as an employee at Alabama State. I was a lawyer just admitted to the bar a year, and if I'm not careful, they'll disbar me like they had disbarred another lawyer not too much earlier. So I knew without saying to anybody that it had to be very careful what we do and how we do it. She said, Fred, what we need to do is uh, sit down and decide how we can get these people to stay off the buses. And let's, I'm going to prepare a leaflet that says another black woman has been off the bus for, uh, on, for and her trial is going to be on Monday. Uh, but we want them to stay off after Monday. I said, well, Joan, if that's true, then we're going to have to make plans. Suppose they stay off. <laughs> then we're going to be, have to be prepared to go farther. Set fire. Well, let, this is what we decided we had to do. One, if that's going to have to, number one, you're going to need a spokesman because somebody's going to have to speak for these black folks and not them try to speak all for themselves. In addition to a spokesman, if we're going to keep them off the bus, we got to somehow raise some money to take care of the expenses. And we're going to have to get somebody to plan a, a system of getting folks to and from wherever they are going. Normally, Mr. E.D. Nixon would have been the head, whatever you call him, because he had more followers than anybody else. But Rufus Lewis, who was a former coach at Alabama State, also had some followers. <laughs> he was concerned primarily about registration and getting people admitted to, to uh, when they are elected, they must be responsible. He ran also a nightclub called the Citizens Club. And guess what? In order to get in there, you had to be a registered voter. So I said, we need to find, we, 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 so these two people, which one are we going to use? Uh, Joanne said, neither one. He said, use my, my pastor. Martin Luther King hadn't been his long, hadn't been involved in civil rights activities or no other activities other than his church. But one thing he can do, he can move people with words. I said, that's what we need. Now, had you met him by that point? Hmm? Had you met Dr. King by I that point? I had met him, yes. I had met him, but I didn't know him. I wasn't a member of his church. Did you think it was a good idea? Did you? I, 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 I told her, I agree with you. And then I said, Joanne, let me give you 
a suggestion for these other two men because we need them because they have some potas. Martin doesn't have anything but the few people who had Dexter. I says, let's make uh, E.D. Nixon treasurer because he's a Pullman car potter and he know A. Philip Randolph in New York and he'll raise some money <laughs> to help these black folks. What we're going to do with Rufus Lewis, thanks to his wife. His wife is half owner of Ross Clayton Funeral Home, the largest funeral home for blacks in Montgomery then and still is. And they, can, they have cars. We need cars to transport people, and they have somebody who drive those cars. So make him chairman of the Transportation Committee. And then you're going to, believe it or not, you're going to need something else. You're going to need a lawyer. Well, here am I, send me. <laughs> those were the plans that we made Martin to be, Dr. King to be the chair. Uh, Mr. The spokesman is what we call them. Mr. Nixon, the treasurer, Rufus Lewis, uh, chairman of the Transportation Committee, and Fred Gray was the legal for doing the legal adverse in part. Our responsibility was to get that word out to other people so that when the official meeting took place at Mount Zion, uh, AME Church. Dr. King was selected chairman before he got to the meeting. Rufus Lewis was elected chairman of the Transportation Committee. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Nixon was selected as treasurer and Fred Gray had the responsibility of doing the legal work. And that seed was planted and passed on to other people and when other people made the motions in the meeting, they didn't know where it came from originally. <laughs> Some of them even thought they originated it themselves. And I take it you and Joanne shot each other looks like. Well, what happened when we won, when uh, the buses started running Monday morning and black folks went on it, we both know that was good. Then we knew we had to go and have Miss 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 Park's case. Well, I knew it. They weren't gonna. They weren't gonna find her not guilty. So I, I knew it was gonna take her all a bit of about 15 or 20 minutes for her case, because I wasn't gonna put on case. I was gonna prepare and reserve my motions, and we're gonna appeal the case. And then these people can go and have these official meetings that they need to have and meet at Hope Street Baptist Church. And when they met and when they heard Dr. King and when Joanne and I sat there and listened, we looked at his, each other and said, well, Fred. And she said, well, Joanne, I think it worked. And it did. So if we're going to work today and then all of these people got together and stayed off of the buses for 380, 82 days, we don't get out there and try to do it by yourself. You need to be able to get somebody else. And if you do that, you may find there's a bother else who think like, who want the same thing mm -hmm. that you want, mm -hmm. even though they may think about doing it a different way. So is it, so when people talk about uh, Ms. Colvin, oh, this, this is the story. Well, they didn't want to use her because she wasn't right. She wasn't the right, you know, she, she had, issues then they wanted they wanted somebody I've heard all these different reasons why describing that yeah this happened nine months before but yeah the, the, the respect the black black folk respectable black folk didn't so, want to use a young girl all of that are things that came up long time after the fact I was a lawyer and I know what those facts are and I did not determined not to file a suit on behalf of Claudette because, as some people say, she were expecting. Whether she was or was not, was not a material fact to me. It's something I would take into consideration. But the reason we did not file the lawsuit for, for uh, Claudette is because the community itself that there was a difference of opinion in the leadership of the community 
as to whether we ought to do it at this time. And a lawyer represent clients. And while Claudette would have been ready for me to have filed a case then, I would rather to have done with her case, what I did later did with uh, Ms. Uh, Park's case, go ahead and appeal her case, take it on up through the system, and at some point along the way, when we can get the community and its leadership together on the fact that they say we ought to file it, then we can do it. And you know what it took for the community to get to that point? When they end up bumming a whole lot of houses, including Reverend King's, they said the time is now ready. <laughs> and a couple of days afterwards, I ended up filing a lawsuit that I had had ready long before, the case of Browder versus Gale, which desegregated the buses in Montgomery. And that's what's called now the rest of the story. Yes, sir. It started off as a one-day boycott. It goes to five days. Were you shocked? Were you surprised? Every day. Every day. Black folks said, we are not stepping foot on that bus. They didn't break. They didn't bend. They stuck with it and the coalition stayed together. I was not, once I saw the people were off of the buses on Monday morning before Mrs. Park's case, uh, that many black people staying off of the buses was, a, was enough to convince me that if we make a reasonable effort to get them to where they are going, we'll be able to do that. And Joanne and I anticipated that when we made the initial plans. So then to motivate that, when you got ready to go to Holy Street Baptist Church that night, beginning at about three o'clock in the afternoon, people started going. And when the time came, and I think it was seven o'clock, you couldn't get almost a block of, of, of the church. And then when you were able to hear Dr. King say, and they make all the plans, and they announced how they were going to have people who was going to be here and there and other places to get them where they were going, these people realized that there's a plan to get us to where we need to go. And we may have to do a little walking, but that's a part of it. I was not surprised then. All I wanted to do was to be sure that as, 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 as best we could, we would be able to do it. And everything that the opposition did against us helped us. They came out one time and said that the bus boycott was over. And he even got at least one of the preachers involved to get involved in that. But we got word of it and told our people, don't you believe it? That's not true. We are going to stay off till we can go back on an integrated basis. That was a part of it. Then in March, when the, uh, they ended up indicting 89 persons, including Mrs. Parks, uh, Mrs. Robinson, uh, Dr. King, and most of the preachers. So that was an incentive. Then I was also indicted by that same grand jury, not for boycotting, but for allegedly representing one of the original five cases in the case of Browder versus Gale. So we had to do that. But as black people saw all these things, that the opposition was doing, they were uh, willing to go continue. Then, when we filed the lawsuit after the bombing of these houses uh, about the 2nd of February, that motivated us. Mm -hmm. And then when we had a hearing of that case and won it, which was in April or May, all of these things helped. 
and it motivated the black people to stay on. So I had no question in my mind at this point, because now just about everybody has made some sort of arrangement to get to where they had to go. And they just stayed off until it ended. It goes from there. It goes to other cities. North Carolina sit-ins take place. SNCC, CORE, Freedom Summer, all of these developments, Marching on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, um, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, all these things happen. As these things are unfolding before your eyes, and you're right there in the middle of it, are and helping you, to make it happen. Happen right, absolutely. I mean, you're 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 saying what I set out to do. We're doing it. We're gonna bring this thing down. I have felt all along. Every time I would file a case in a different area to end discrimination, in my own mind, I say, well, Ed. We've done some, but we have some more to do. It's somewhat like after the boycott was over and when Dr. King uh, no longer had anything to do, he's now an international figure with no organization and no people to lead. Right. And that gave rise to the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And when they made that, that uh, when they found it and he moved on to Atlanta and Abernathy moved on and uh, uh, Reverend Lowry all moved on. He said to me when he was leaving Montgomery, he said, well, Fred, you represented me in the movement well. And SCLC is going to develop into another strong civil rights organization. Do you want to go over to Atlanta with us and be joint counsel for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I said, Martin, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. But my job in Alabama is not finished yet. This is just the beginning of it. But anytime you need me, whether it's in Alabama or Georgia or wherever, all you have to do is call and I'll come. So uh, I realize that all of these things as they unfold were another step toward carrying out the object and purpose that I had secretly, and it's good I kept it secretly, and I didn't even tell people till about 30 or 40 years after <laughs> I was practicing law. <laughs> I tell them, they, they knew I wanted to be a lawyer and I was a lawyer, but nobody knew that before I had done anything, I behind doing all of that was to be able to destroy everything segregated I could find. And I believe with a lot of help along the way, during the last 66 years, I have been instrumental in at least helping to change some of it. But the struggle for equal justice continues. Many people. Yes, sir. Believe. And Congressman John Lewis often said that after the Voting Rights Act passed, he felt that was really the end of the civil rights movement. After that, after, and then of course, 68 coming. April 4th, 68. Where are you? And what is your reaction to what takes place in Memphis? Well, you know. The Hamilton Montgomery March, when they had Bloody Sunday, they called me and I went over and I filed Jose Williams and uh, John Lewis versus Governor Wallace the next day, less than 24 hours, about 24 hours after it happened. So uh, I knew that was another step. But I never thought that that was the end. I knew we were having trouble even with the school cases that I filed in 63, and now it's just 65. But that should have uh, given the opposition, if they 
thought about it, they said, well, we ought to treat these people right. But they never gotten to that point. And I think one of the most disappointing things in my own little mind as, I, as a boy from Alabama, and I'm not, I'm not a, 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 country, a, a lawyer for the whole nation. My work was primarily here in Alabama. That's what I wanted, and that's where I primarily have stayed. I helped other areas. But you have to be able to keep focused on where you are. And I realized, but my, most of the things that I was trying to say, and when you get 90, you don't always follow them correctly. But the point is that you just can't, I've gotten that one a little bit off, but the point I wanted to make is as we try to change things, you have to be in a position to continue right. to move along in the direction that you should be going. April 4th, 68. Where are you? What's that? April 4th, 1968. Memphis tragedy strikes. Where are you? How do you find out? How do you feel? You're talking about Dr. King's death? Yeah. Uh, I was uh, here in Tuskegee at that time. And of course, I was very sorry and very, very upset over his death. But it was one of those things that we always knew, and he always knew even as early as the bus boycott, and this was several years before, that there was a possibility of losing our lives in the movement. So we have to be prepared to do it. But even so, he still believed in nonviolence and social change. Were you prepared? Yes, indeed so. And uh, there were some people in the movement who didn't believe in that. And my brother happened to have been one, but uh, I did believe in that. But you have to be able to stay focused and move ahead and do it in the right direction. But when I heard about Dr. King, and if you remember, uh, when he published his first book, he was stabbed mm -hmm. at a department store in New York. Yep. So he re realized that he would, uh, he may get killed. And he knew that was always a possibility. But, you know, you never want those possibilities to happen. And I was very sorry about it. And, but we couldn't stop. He wouldn't want us to stop. And we didn't stop. And we continue. How does Fred Gray feel? when he sees Black Lives Matter, when he sees these new young lawyers, when, he see, when you see this next generation doing what they do? I think Black Lives Matter is just, they are just developing what some people earlier called was Black Power, what some call the movement. And all of these were simply short turns for trying to do what African Americans have tried to do and have been doing since they were brought here in slavery. And that is to do away with inequality and to do away with racism. And this is simply their form of trying to do the same. We've chipped at it. Mm -hmm. We have just about removed all the laws that required segregation, but now they enforce it without the laws right. and have the same results. We've always had police brutality. That's nothing unusual. 
and there have been lawsuits filed early on. So what they are doing is simply an extension of what we did and what our four parents started, and we all have to continue to work on it. When somebody says nothing has changed, what do you say? What is your response to that when you hear somebody today say, man, nothing has changed from those days in Selma and Montgomery and Birmingham? There have been a lot of things that have changed, and I can go back to when I started to practice law. Everything was completely segregated. Restaurants, schools, churches, and even sometime ladies, particularly in, in department stores, they wouldn't let black uh, ladies dress, put the dresses on. Uh, employment, conditions in health care, uh, residential segregation, educational institution, every institution from kindergarten to graduate and professional schools in Alabama was segregated by law when I started practicing. And I filed lawsuits which destroyed it in all the educational institutions of higher learning and in about 110 or 120 uh, secondary and elementary cases. Uh, everything was completely segregated. It is not, seg and it was by law. So in employment, our people couldn't get decent jobs. Right. We have people now doing great jobs. Even the job you have and what you're doing now could not have been done at those days. So when somebody say that nothing has changed, they don't know their history. And they are, in fact, the recipients of some of the changes that has taken place. Right. A lot of people don't think about legacy. They don't think about what people will remember them by. They don't think about the work. You're living history. There's a bust of you sitting right over there. Um, there are folks talking about renaming streets after you and all kinds of stuff. When a black girl or a white boy, a Latino boy or girl in Alabama or somewhere in America, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, is reading and they see the name Fred Gray, what do you want that child to know? who Fred Gray really was? Well, I, I would want them to know that Fred Gray was a young man who during his teenage years, he saw that there were serious problems existing in Montgomery, Alabama, particularly on the buses, but in every aspect of American life. And I would want them to know that he learned that somewhere along the line, lawyers supposed to help people who have problems. And I saw those problems and I was willing, without anybody prodding me to doing it, but after I decided I got a lot of help along the way, that I was going to try to change those things so that what we did then uh, what happened so that we're doing segregated, we will no longer be able to do that. But I would become a lawyer and I would help to change those things. In short, I would want you to believe and want them to believe that I saw I was a lawyer who represented clients who had problems and was able to help solve those problems. And I would hope that whatever they would do in their life, when they see problems in their communities, 
that they would try to help solve them. But I also want them to believe that you can't solve those problems by yourself. And I realize that. Talk to somebody else, work with others on it, and but you, you don't know, you just might start a movement. <laughs> Gregory, I appreciate it. I thank you for your work. I thank you for doing all that you did to bring down Jim Crow. And I say more importantly, I thank your wife for making you do this. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate her doing it too. And uh, you will, as I look back, uh, Roland, over these 66 years, there are a couple of things I, uh, I really, I've seen these changes. But I want people to also know, and we have a whole two or three generations who know nothing at all about Jim Crowism. We're having this interview in the Tuskegee Human Civil Rights Multicultural Center, which is a history museum that they need to come and see because it tell, talks about not only black people, but what it, Native Americans have done, mm -hmm what European Americans have done and what African Americans have done. And you can see it all under one roof. And you can even see where the federal government mistreated those men in the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. And we are sitting on a part of the memorial for those men. And then it is a brief history of the struggle that Africans have made from slavery to now. And you'll find on the west wall over there four or five cases filed by, by residents of this county mm -hmm. that not only helped them in farm subsidies and serving on juries and learning to vote, but have helped those all over the country. So they need to come and be educated on that. But they also need to know that the struggle for equal justice continues. And not only do these young people who are black need to know that, but our white brothers and sisters and all the other ethnic groups in this nation needs to know it. But they need to know the struggle continues. What happened a few weeks ago at the Capitol as we saw it unfold, we mm. wondered whether we were in America or not. Right. Could this be America? So when we see that and see behind it racism and recognize that the last four years of the administration that it had has done nothing to get us together but to separate us, we need to realize that those two problems that we had are really in there. And that is racism and inequality are still the problems that's out there. We need, and I was happy to hear our new president say that he's going to do something about solving those problems. So, because if we don't know the problem is there, we won't solve it. So if we can get those problems, we recognize we have the problem, then do what we did here in Montgomery. Come up with a plan to eliminate it. Get some people together, work together. Once you get a plan, execute the plan. And then remember that every one of us, while we would like for it to be start at the top about uh, is wrong and a plan from the Pride House to the Congress, to the Supreme Court, to all those things, but every one of us gonna have to do it. And unless we do it, we will still years later when we are gone, our ancestors will have to be working with these same problems. But we have a generation that I think, if they're willing to do it the right way, and I still think that what Dr. King and we did in the movement of doing it on a non-violent manner mm -hmm. is the way to solve it. And we thank you very much. Yes, sir.